All right. I had big ambitions to do a video last night. Uh, well, for starters, I blew the speaker in my Leslie, which was a real bummer. I always sit between my basement and my Leslie to get a stereo effect, and with the Leslie swirling behind me, it, it just sounds cool. So while I'm waiting on a new speaker, or a, I'll probably get a heavier duty speaker for that, the Delta 10A from Eminence, 4 ohm. Either way, well, that's going to take six or seven weeks. I thought I would use the Bandmaster, the 59 Bandmaster, to replace the Leslie's to get my little stereo effect going. So I turned this thing on. Uh, it worked good the first day. Then the second day, I hit it with a, a boost, the Alienist, and all of a sudden the volume dropped out. And it was just on the uh, instrument channel. These are a little bit different. They're four channel and you can jump them, but this one's labeled instrument and this one's mic. But this one's brighter, kind of like the bright channel in the basement. And uh, we're going to troubleshoot it and see what what's going on. I, I was getting a lot of static and volume increases and decreases. And of course, the first uh, fear is that you've lost an Astron cap because this still has all the original Astrons. But it's not acting like that. I'm pretty sure it's probably loose tube socket pins. And I'm, so we're going to retension the pins. And, uh, and so let's get started. All right, generally... There's a lot of simple things you can do. Retention the tube sockets, especially these old ones. Spray uh, deoxid, this good old stuff. D100, spray that in the pots. Check for weak or cold solder joints and bad ground connections. Like I said, I don't know why it's just that one input. I'm hoping it's just the pins on the V1 tube socket. Look, I still have the, the original asbestos on here. People freak out when they see that. They go running. Just don't touch it and you're okay. But if I die of, what's it called, asbestosis, I'll have my wife, I'll have a wife, my a wife, my wife, make a video of why I died. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's see if we can look in here. And it looks original, and all the Astrons are original, but these have been redone, and I put the cardboard tubes on from the old caps to make it look a little more authentic. You can see some of these don't fit so well. That one doesn't fit at all, because the new caps are small, too small. But uh, these are the two that you really don't want to go bad and it still has look at this still has Lupe's tape in there Lupe put this one together still got the fender uh, inspection sticker oh a California inspection sticker on the speaker still got the original cord even which I will not change but uh, the only thing that's not original is this tube cover. It was missing one when I got it, so I had to get a replacement. But these tube sockets are getting kind of loose, and we're going to retension them. So last night I unplugged it. Turn both the standby and the power switch on. 
and that generally discharges the caps but what I do is I go into pin one here and just ground that out and that should discharge the caps uh, I also like to go down each cap and just touch it with this ground out each cap just in case you can also check it with a meter at DMM to see if you got any power left in these things uh, not that easy to get to And believe me, they can discharge and then kind of build up again. Because uh, I've, I've, you can hear it. You can hear it coming through the speaker sometime. Actually, where you can hear the sound coming through the speakers is when you touch the tube socket pins. I mean the power tubes. I hear nothing. Rectifier. So it's good to go. All right, we got it out. As much as I hate changing tubes and trying to get tubes to sound good, I will go ahead and check these with my tube tester. Uh, can't remember exactly what I've got in here. Uh, the thing feels pretty tight, really. This is a GE6072. It's a RCA12AX7. And this is an RCA uh, Dumont 12AX7. Don't know who the manufacturer is of that one, but. And then the good old Tongue Saw 5881s. So I'll probably check the bias on those to be sure they haven't drifted a whole bunch. So all I'm going to do is take this dental tool. You see that? Dental pick. I'm going to go down in between. The outer side of each contact and push it in just slightly. Like I said, they're so old that they don't really stay there for very long, but it might help. The deoxid will help. And there's only two halves on these things, so you just push on the outside of both sides and just go around, do all the pins here I'll also check the power tube sockets I mean ideally you would put new sockets in these things because these get pretty worn out but hopefully this solves the problem all right I did that now I'm going to spray a little bit of deoxid in each one of these out a little bit all right now that I did that we're gonna start investigating this area these pots all the uh, solder joints especially the grounds where the grounds go from here to this copper plate up here that runs all the way across the control panel they all look good and you're not supposed to use a metal probe but I'll go get my uh, chopstick here in a minute because I am actually going to turn the amp on 
and pound or uh, poke around in here and see if I find any pops or crackles. Also, I'm going to put some deoxid in these pots. Work those babies around. These are all the original. This amp is pretty much all original except for the Recone speakers. And I had to replace the fuse holder. Because it broke over the years. Now here's the pot that's in question right here. And I'm going to hopefully get this thing cleaned up. The solder joints look good. Yeah, I'm, I'm really thinking it was probably more a tube socket. But, if I turn it on after this, and it's still making that noise, well, there's a piece of something there. I need to investigate that further. I don't know what that is. Huh. Let's check that out. You just want to do a general house cleaning. I mean, I'm down here, and there's quite a bit of lint built up on these plug contacts just probably from falling through the hole and collecting on here so I'll clean these up spray deoxid on the inputs but yeah the ones that I don't use they have a lot a lot of lint you just want to clean it up so everything's making good contact but this piece that I found over here looks like a piece of phenolic. And it may have been there forever. It doesn't look like it's supposed to be there. It looks like a piece of a... The base of a 5881 or a piece of my... Piece of my uh, tube socket. I don't know. We'll pull it out and see what happens. All right, we're gonna pull this little piece of plastic or phenolic, whatever it is, out of there and see why it's there. I have no clue. I've never seen that before. Wow. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I don't know what that was, and I'll find it. It just shot off somewhere. Here it is. I have no clue what this thing is. It's a very small OD, and it definitely looks ancient, like the old brown base phenolic like these tubes here but where that came from I have no idea it's probably been in there forever okay I think I may have found the problem so when you when you plugged into this jack here which is the mic jack it's kind of like the normal channel on a basement and then this one is the instrument channel, which is more like the bright channel. It, uh, it's just this channel. So this jack, if you follow it, goes through this yellow astron. And then those wires go to the first triode of the first preamp tube. These two wires in particular the plate and the grid and then the second channel the one I'm having the trouble with the instrument channel goes through this astron and to the other triode of the first preamp tube 
over here. Now see this one right here? How it's going up and down real easily. It's pretty loose. Uh, let me see. It's looser than it looks here. See how loose it is in that socket? Shoot, it's almost about ready to come out. I'm almost positive that you know, it was up here when I put the tube in and I just didn't push it down good enough for it to get on top of the, around the pin of the tube. Because the other ones are not, on this side, they're not loose. Well, I say that. Actually, they are pretty loose. But, uh, this is the problem with old sockets. I'm tempted to replace this thing, but I just hate to mess with it too much. I'm gonna get that, get those in there and push them down real good. And I even sprayed the oxid on all these ground connections just to clean out any corrosion that might be there. I don't like to make a big mess, but it'll it'll clean it up a little bit. I definitely don't want to get anything on Loopy's signature over here. Grounds are very important and this corrosion down here, it's not going to affect anything, but I'll come in here and clean it up a little bit just so it doesn't run all over the place. Make sure it doesn't get on Loopy. Oh my gosh. Why did I touch Loopy? She came off. Who, boy, what am I gonna do now? I gotta keep her on there. Oh my goodness, look at Loopy. Finally moved her. I don't know what kind of cement I'm gonna use. Probably a little just contact cement. Oh man, old amps. They're charm like old cars. Definitely don't want to lose Lupe because that's the only one I've got out of all my amps. Oh, one other thing I wanted to show you that's really important. And you see these little spaces right here, this thing that opens up on both inputs. And there's a little tab in there. I don't know if you can see it. But that has to make good contact, so when you're not plugged in, that grounds out that jack so that you don't end up with a short... Actually, I'm not sure that's the right terminology, but those contacts in there are very important, and they can corrode too. So I always spray a little bit of deoxid in there. See, some people will even go in there with a little piece of wet dry sandpaper and clean those out. And you'll see when you plug your guitar in, watch it will spread apart. It opens up that connection. And if you were to pull your guitar plug out and you still had a, a loud hum like it, you were touching the end of the plug right here, then that probably a good indicator that this isn't making contact. Should probably never have trouble on a new amp. I'm gonna run this in there. So I stick it in there while it's open, then I pull the plug out and pull the paper out. And that kind of just cleans that contact. Let's do it again. We'll do it on this one. Spread it apart, go this direction and clean that side, pull it out, pull the sandpaper out, put it back in, turn this over, pull the plug out, whoop, darn it, lost my sandpaper. There you go, that'll clean those contacts out. Spray it one more time. Now 
Yeah, you wouldn't know that those are super important. Hopefully you can see that little knob sticking out. That's the contact. Those are switched jacks, I think is what they call them. That's what they mean by switched. But, um, all right. Let's see what else we can clean up around here. Just so you can see, this is pretty cool. Lupe was a famous amp assembler in F at Fender in 1950 uh, for many years, but late 50s, early 50s. I don't know when she started, but can you see that? Anyway, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to get some double-sided tape and put it on there. But she signed this way back in 1959. You don't really need to use a plug on these things. I was just trying to demonstrate how they work, but you can just push them open. Put the sandpaper in there. Just very lightly, you don't want to wear that out. But there's also one, this is where the speakers connect. I made this uh, short wire, it's actually about six feet long, with a female on one end and a male on the other so I can Plug the amp in, the speakers, you don't ever want to turn your amp on without speakers or you burn up the transformer, the output transformer. And then I'll go over here and plug in the speakers right here, see? I might even spray some deoxid in here just because this thing hasn't been around. Hasn't been used in a while. So now I've got the speakers hooked up and I can put the tubes back in here and turn the amp on and tap around and see if I hear any static. And that's a really good way of troubleshooting. Here's another good idea. Take these knobs off and check and make sure all these nuts are tight because that, that's part of your ground too. That tightens it up against that brass plate. If these ever were to get loose, which I don't think that one's loose at all, I hate to take them all off and check. I think they're fine, but if they get loose, you'll start getting some weird results. Um, you get a lot of static and things like that. Intermittent connections and I'm gonna just check that one just to be sure. Uh, probably should use a better type of wrench, but I just wanna see. of being loose not at all it's tight tight all right it's a good thing to check though put my knob back on there all right when you do um, retention these sockets you want to be sure that you don't force the tube back in there because sometimes when you get those push those contacts in too much you yeah, actually that's just exactly what you do push them in too much and uh, you'll push those pins right out of the, the phenolic base and damage the socket but you know, now that I'm putting these in, I just realized that I'm going to test these first. Because you want a good matched phase inverter tube. And I'm just going to double check these. So I'll go get the tube tester and we'll double check these. Okay, here we got a tube test. 
just go, you watch the meter over here. If that meter moves at all, you got some shorts or leakage. And then I go to plate two. You're supposed to actually tap on the tube while you do this, but. Okay, that's, that's uh, shorts and leakage. And you test for gas. And you t test for mutual conductance. Uh, let's see what else. One thing you got to do is adjust the line voltage so that you get a true test. That's why you have this. I can't see it over here, but this is a line adjustment. So you hold down the line adjustment knob over here, and then you get the meter right in the center, so you're always getting an accurate reading. So it's right in the center there. So we're going to check and see. Press S5. You got the bias set at 14 like it's supposed to. And this one's reading at, oh, about 230 on the one triode. That's what I like about this uh, Hickok 752 is you can do both triodes real easy. You just push plate two. And that one is matched. It's about 230 on both sides. Now this, the only thing I don't like about this 752 tester is that uh, 12 AX7s test very low on the meter and it's accurate, but it doesn't give you a lot of leeway to figure out between a bad tube and a good tube. Those two tubes look good. Uh, to test gas, you have to change the multiplier. And, shoot, I forgot. Uh, it's been a while since I've used this thing. Let's see, gas. How do I do that? You hold down the gas one button, there you go, and you turn the bias until you get the meter to move to the hundred, uh, nah, I just call it the hundred mark, which, uh, there, okay, there it goes, I don't know if you can see the meter, it's a hundred, and then you uh, hit the gas two button, and if it doesn't go up another, uh, less than another hundred mark, which is two marks on the meter, then it's good to go. So that one's fine. I very rarely find tubes that have gas problems. I found a few shorts and leakages over the years, but I couldn't live without this tube tester. Let's test the power tubes. And for the power tubes, see they have this roll chart right here. Can't see that I'm rolling it. It has about every tube ever made on there. And I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. I said, yeah, I don't know if you remember. In the old days, they had tube testers at the 7-Eleven. And you'd go, if your tube TV was on the blink, you would take out some tubes and go down to the 7-Eleven, test your tubes on one of these. If you found one bad, you'd just pick out a tube because they had a rack of tubes there. And 99% of the time, it never fixed the problem. He ended up calling the TV repairman anyway. <laughs> I'll never forget. Yeah, you put a tube in and still do the same thing. But, uh, boy, that was the old days. I, I wrote out all the settings for each tube just cause so I didn't have to go through the roll chart. And for a 5881, you have to set these up right or you can actually damage your tube. Uh, before you put the tube in. So I'm at 12.6 volts, which is a 12 AX7. So you got to go to 6.3 volts. And then you set these to 7, 2. This sets all the different tests correctly. 7, 2, 0. Uh, let's see. 3481. 3481. So it's not as complicated as it looks, 
Just double check it. 5881, 6.3 volt. And you have to set the bias to 7250, 3481. All right, 3481, 7250. Set the bias at 17, which is over here. And this one will also tell you how much life is left in the tube. I don't know how accurate it is, but it, it, it works. Uh, 17, put this test uh, multiplier at times 10. You push the F S5 button, and it should be, for a good tube, should read over 300. So, after you get that set up, then you put your tube in. With every different type of tube, you always have to check your line voltage because each tube draws a little different amperage, I think is what it is. So these draw more, so you have to adjust your line voltage up a little bit to get that meter back at the center. You always check that all the time. All right, it's warmed up a little bit. Now you just push the S5, and it's reading around 600 micro moles, as they say. Well, it's dropping a little bit. It's supposed to be over 300. And if you want to test the life on this thing, oh, you go to shunt, and you hold down the S5, and you turn the shunt until you get it up to a thousand which it's at a thousand right now and then you push the life test button up here and if it stays pretty steady up there it doesn't drop too much the tube's got a lot of life left and this thing's not moving I usually see them drop a little bit that tube's a strong tube there. I knew I put some really good tubes in this uh, Bandmaster. But we also have to check to be sure the bias is close. That's that. I'll test the other one and then we'll get to the bias. You can also test your rectifier tubes on here too, which is uh, this is a 5U4GB. And like I said, you got to be sure you get this. This is 5 volt, so you got to set this at 5. 8200, there's no grid, just filament. And, well, plate and filament. And this is one plate is 6,000, and the other one you would set to 4,000. And you got to set it on shunt. You saw the light come on here. This this thing takes a lot of current. That's a line fuse, that light that came on. You definitely gotta check your line voltage here. Yeah, I gotta boost it up quite a bit for this test. Rectifier. And I actually need to retension the pin the pins in this socket. My other two wasn't making very good contact. But we'll let this warm up a little bit. All right, a good, good rectifier. I will read over uh, 650 for plate one. And you push the S3 rectifier button. 650, so this is five, 556, 657, almost 725. And now we'll go to the other one. Let's see, 35, we'll set the shunt to 30. Bias at zero. This plate will be four, zero, zero, zero. Push the S3, see what happens. Oh boy, that side's up to over 900. 30, 4,000. 
Yeah, so that side's pretty strong. I don't know. I don't think you can do a two life test on that. I have to read. But that's it. So I retested this 5U4 on the first plate. 5, 550, 6, 650. I mean, it's right at 650 and the other one was 900. So I might be, I might benefit from finding a newer 5U4 or a new old stock 5U4. I, I might have some. I'm going to have to go look. But that might be something that I, I look at to make sure this amp is sounding its best. It's at 5, 550, 6, 6, it's right at 650, which is the minimum. Okay, I did have at least one. I saw this and I grabbed it. RCA, not sure what this one is. It looks like the manufacturing date is 1975 on this one, so let's hope it's a little stronger. It turns out I have quite a few of these. Um, it's another RCA from 72. Check this one out. And I was showing a thousand and a thousand on this one, so I don't know why I had this worn out one, it looked like, in there. There's, there are those two, but you can see. Here's my power tube. Dash. Most of them are not that great anymore, but here are all my rectifiers. Um, I've got another one here. It says Good and Band Bandmaster. So I have more 5U4s than I thought. And this one's bad. GZ34. Those... those uh, Muller GZ34s are so expensive, but I've got a couple of possibly bad, that one says. This one might be good. I have a spare, because you never know when you're going to need one. Yeah, I got the preamp tubes back in. I'm going back with this Dumont tube that I think was in the Bandmaster when I got it. Still a good rectifier. I'm not sure what the date code is. I'm assuming it's in the 60s, but it goes over here. Make sure you got a good grip on there. I'm going to put my uh, bias probes in here to check the bias before we put it back together. Alright, I'll put you right here so I can show you what I'm doing. Uh, I come in here and I push all these pins back down. Actually, I could do it with my fingers since it's not... hasn't been turned on or plugged in or anything just to get those pins down around the tube pins connectors make sure they're nice and solid and like I said this is the drawbacks of having an old amp and an old, old socket because to keep it original, you gotta kind of live with these things. I've changed a few sockets in my other amps that aren't quite as valuable. Just uh, don't have the power tubes in there. power tubes in, check the bias, 
hook it up and we'll probably go test it out. All right, I got the bias probe hooked up. It seems like the instrument channel is pretty quiet. For some reason, on the mic channel, getting a little hum. Not really sure what that's all about. Either way, I'm running at about 408 volts of plate voltage. I've got my, uh, let's see if you can see it over here. I run all my vintage amps on this thing. The Carl Hartman Amp Preserver. And it's at about 117 now. Line voltage is at just under 125, 124 and a half. And then I can go all the way down to 110 volts too. But I run them, I run all my amps at 117. So I've got this amp running at 117. It's 408 volts of plate voltage. And here's the bias probe readings 38. And then I have this switch where I can go between twos, which I love the dual probes. 38 and 40. So they're pretty close within 5%. Um, 38. Let's see, 40 and a half, 38, so that's 2 millivolts. Yeah, that's, you want them within, you know, 10%. They don't have to be perfectly matched, but it's, they do sound, I think, a little stronger when they are matched. So, I'll go to my little bias chart. 408 volts is pretty low for plate voltage, and also... You know, your rectifier tube over here, it'll make a difference in how much voltage is in the whole system. So when you change your rectifier, you should check your voltage and your bias again. Um, I don't remember what it was in the beginning. But I went to the store and I got some double stick tape. I'm going to use that to stick Lupe's... Uh, name signature tape back on my amp and I'm gonna take the probe off right now and we'll go tap around and see if we find any loose connections. Alright we're gonna tap around a little bit. I can already tell I think I fixed it. I don't hear any of that weird noise. On the instrument or mic and even the hum went down. I think one thing I found out was that these bias probe sockets need to be retentioned themselves. I mean, the tubes were fitting too loose in there and they actually weren't even making contact. When I switched it, sometimes you can flip the power tubes in the sockets and you'll get a different reading. So it's always good to try if they're way out of, uh, if they're not, you know, close as far as matched goes, flip them and try it, try it again and see if they'll measure closer. Like I said, right now they're within 5%, so that's plenty good. And the thing I'm tapping in here, if the volume's up a little bit, just, you just tap every joint, every single thing. And if you hear a click or something, you'll know. The main part is just making sure everything is grounded properly. I mean, the grounds have always been good. I just, just checking. Yeah, these these things wear out like old cars. That's why you use the chopsticks so you don't get electrocuted. And you only use one hand in the chassis. You never put two hands in there, or you'll 
create a loop and ground yourself out and could be the end of you. Sometimes I'm tapping the tube down here. Sometimes you get microphonic tubes. Sometimes you get microphonic power tubes. Volumes all the way up. That one still hums a little bit, but not near as bad as it was. I think we're in good shape. Let's go try it out. Yeah, I mean, before... Before, when I would hit an overdrive pedal, it would just start freaking out. So it all boiled down to just a loose tube socket. And unfortunately, that's what you get with these old amps. And I'm, I really can't change them out. I would love to, but I just want to leave this thing as original as I can keep it. But uh, my next video is going to be pretty cool. I've got a new Fuzz OCD secret. But now it's the silicon fuzz and OCD. And a new setting on the OCD. I mean, that's the Bandmaster. It's not a basement only because it doesn't have as much bass. And it really doesn't have as much power. Uh, you saw that 5U4 uh, rectifier. It doesn't put out as much voltage. and It's just a lower, lower wattage amp. Three speakers. But uh, still a cool amp. A great collector's item. But uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks for watching.